Where's your right hand right now? Just to be sure, why don't you go ahead and look at it and also touch it with your left hand. Now, how'd you do that? Well, you have so many sources of information that are coming in all the time, right? You have your touch sensation, stretch sensors in, very, in all of your muscles. You can feel pinches, you can feel warmth, you can feel cool, you can feel the motion of air, you can feel pressure, you can feel weight. All of these things combine and you know exactly where every part of your body is at every moment in time, right? The problem though is that as we've talked about before, there are delays in neural information actually reaching your brain. So how is it possible that you can know where every part of your body is, like your right hand just now, when there's a delay in the information actually making it to your brain? Well, maybe, yeah, there's neural delays, but your hand wasn't really doing anything when I asked you to find your right hand. So the delays might not have mattered. Your right hand was just sitting there still. So an alternative possibility is that actually you didn't find your right hand by knowing where the hand was due to direct experience of the hand. Instead, you had a projection or a prediction of where that right hand was. And that prediction was what you used to try and find your right hand. So how could we ever know which one of these things is actually going on? Are we experiencing our bodies directly or are we predicting the position of our bodies from moment to moment? So there's a simple home experiment that you can do to tell the difference. So cover one eye with one of your hands. Then with your open eye, focus on some still object that's off in the distance somewhere. Take the index finger of your other hand and just push gently against the outside of your eye. Now, the thing you want to try and notice is does the world seem to move when you push on your eye? Now, this is a really important experiment because we move our eyes all the time. All the time, we're moving our eyes all over the place. And as we do that, the information that's hitting our retinas is changing. Yet, we don't experience the world shaking. We experience a still world. Somehow, our body is able to, or our brain is able to subtract out the motion of our eyes and give us the impression of a still world. But when we push against our eyes in the experiment that you're doing right now, it's a very different type of motion. If it's the case that your body knows about where the eyes are through stretch receptors in the muscles around your eye, it shouldn't matter if the eyes are moving due to muscles of the, uh, due to the muscles around the eyeball or due to the pushing against the eye with your finger. By contrast, if it's the case that we know about the position of our eyes by watching the motor signals that are coming out of the brain and using those to update predictions, then the pushing against the eye is not going to be part of the prediction. We don't usually push against our eyes in order to move them, so that's not something that the brain is able to counter for. So which is it? Did the world shake when you pushed against your eye, or did the world stay still? The experience that I have and the experience most people have is that the world shakes. And what this tells us then is that usually in our everyday lives, from moment to moment, we don't actually know where our eyes are. Instead, we predict where our eyes are on the basis of the outgoing motor commands that we send to our eyeballs. When we push against the eye, that's not a motor command going out to the eye, so we can't counter for it. We can't account for it in our prediction of the world. So therefore, when the retinal image moves, we assume it must be because the entire world shook since we have no prediction that the eye moved. This peels back the curtain on the illusion that is our present moment just a little bit, and it shows us that actually we experience the present moment through a projected physical body or a body schema. We don't actually experience the body in any kind of a direct way. So in the paper I'm going to tell you about today, Kazumichi Matsumiya reports that there are multiple body schemas. So not only do we not even experience the body directly, we experience a projection of the body. We actually experience multiple projections of the body at every moment in time. And specifically, our perception of our bodies changes depending upon whether we're using our eyes or using our hands. Hi there. I'm Adam Dede, and welcome to a Neuroscience Journal Club, where I bring you a weekly discussion of a recently published paper from the world of neuroscience. So let's jump right in. Matsumiya wanted to study how it is that the brain generates the body schema that is used for representing the body at every point in time. 
As we just talked about, this schema isn't really a direct representation of the body. Instead, it's a moment-to-moment -moment prediction of where we think the body is at any given time. And you just saw with, this exper with the experiment of pushing against your eyeball that it must be a schema. It must be a prediction. It cannot be a direct experience. And for more evidence of this, think about phantom limb syndrome. This is a syndrome wherein people who have lost a limb to amputation still experience having sensations from their now lost limb. If it's not the case that we predict and project our representation of our bodies, then how could it ever be the case that we have sensations from limbs that don't exist? In general, there's the assumption that the body schema is built out of three pieces of information. Incoming sensory information coming into the brain from the body, outgoing motor commands that are being sent both to our ongoing representation or prediction of the body and to the motor uh, effectors out in the body themselves, and then also some just general knowledge about the physical measurements of the body, how long is your femur, and so on. By combining these three sets of information, incoming information, outgoing information, and some kind of static variables about the general physical properties of the body, it's thought that it's possible to constantly know and represent the location of the body in space. And what Matsumiya wanted to know was whether or not the brain represents the body in the same way, no matter what task is being used. So in order to do this, he simply asked people to simultaneously look at their right hand and also touch it with their left, the same task that I asked you to do at the beginning of this video. He did this in a highly controlled way. Participants' hands were placed on a table in front of them, and there was a plexiglass plate just above their hand, making it impossible for them to actually touch it. In addition, they were wearing virtual reality headsets so that they couldn't actually see their own hand. They had to just look at where they thought it was, and they had to just reach their left hand to touch where they thought it was. But they didn't get any feedback about how correct they were on each individual reach or each individual gaze. In a series of experiments, participants were asked to systematically touch and gaze at particular locations on their right hand. So for example, they might be asked to touch, the, to touch and look at the fingertip of the index finger, or the knuckle at the base of the ring finger, things like that. By looking at the reach and gaze positions that participants generated given these landmarks, Matsumiya was, was able to build up an idea of what the participants' mental representations of their own hands actually looked like. Now, in the first experiment that he did, participants were viewing a table through the VR headset, similar to the table that was in front of them, and they were seeing a virtual reality hand on that table, in a similar position to their own hand, but with no direct representation of their own hand. And the data Matsumiya generated looked something like this. So the filled in dots on this schematic represent the true veridical positions of each participant's knuckles and fingertips for their entire hand. And then the open circles on the top are representing for us the locations that participants gazed at. And on the bottom are representing the positions that participants reached out to touch. And what we can see is that in general, there's a little bit of an underestimation of how long the fingers are and there's a little bit of an overestimation of how wide the hand is overall. And, and in addition, you can see that the degree of underestimation is a little bit less in the eye movements than in the hand movements, indicating that eye movements are somewhat more accurate than hand movements. Now, because VR headsets are known to have certain distortions of physical space perception, it was possible that the underestimation of finger length and the overestimation of hand width was just, an, uh, was just a confounding factor of the fact that participants were looking through VR headsets. So to try and get around this, Matsumiya had participants do a second experiment in which the virtual reality hand that was represented on the table was now turned sideways. If it was the case that the errors were being driven by something weird about the VR, then what we should see now is that the nature of those distortions should be shifted 90 degrees. But instead, the data from the first experiment were perfectly replicated, and the underestimation of finger length was replicated, as was the overestimation of hand width, indicating that it wasn't just some kind of a confounding, weird distortion due to the VR. So what these data suggest, then, is that actually there are different mental representations of the hand, depending upon if those mental representations are being used to guide gaze or used to, guise, or used to guide reach. It's really a pretty strange thing. 
So to conceptualize this, look at these two maps. Both of them show the US, but they're totally different maps. One of them emphasizes the topography, and the other emphasizes population. Obviously, these two maps will come in handy at different times, depending on your purpose. So it makes sense to have different maps for the same thing, depending on the purpose. Still though, it's surprising to think that your brain's map of your hand position should be different depending on when a map is needed to guide reach, or a saccade, or eye movement. One possibility could have been that it was really the same map, but for some reason there's more noise in hand movements than there is in eye movements. And if this was the case, then two things should be predicted. One, any manipulation that affects the nature of accuracy in one modality should affect the accuracy in the other modality similarly. And then two, if we look at some sort of a performance metric in one modality, it should correlate really well with a performance metric in the other modality. And the reason for this is because if both of them are fundamentally relying on the same underlying map, that map will have the same amount of accuracy, whether it's being used to guide hand motion or eye motion. To examine these possibilities, Matsumiya repeated his experiment a third time, but this time there was no VR hand being represented on the table. Participants just viewed a blank table and had to make hand and eye motions to indicate their belief about where their hand was. In this instance, what, they, what Matsumiya found was that the reach motion was hardly affected. In fact, participants exhibited the same level of accuracy as they had before. By contrast, gaze now became much worse than it had been before when there had been a virtual reality hand. So what this indicated was that a manipulation of the experiment by changing the nature of the visual cues that were being shown to the participant. So what Matsumiya found then was that a manipulation of the visual stimuli that were being shown to the participant fundamentally changed the nature of the map for hand position that was being used to guide gaze, but didn't change the nature of the map being used to guide reach behavior. So this shows us that actually there are indeed different schema representing the two different modalities, reach and gaze. Next, Matsumiya used his data to calculate a shape index, which was simply the ratio between the length and the width of the hand as derived from the two different modalities of data. What he found was that there was no correlation between the shape indices calculated from reach data versus the shape indices calculated from gaze data. And again, this shows us that these must be different underlying schemata that are being used to guide the behavior for reach versus the behavior for gaze. Again, if they were the same, we would have expected that these two measures should have been well correlated, but they weren't. So Matsumiya performed a few other control experiments and checks, which are beyond the scope of this video to go through right now. But one thing that you might be wondering about is, okay, this seems a little bit strange. How are participants getting this stuff at all wrong? Shouldn't they know the back of their own hand like the back of their own hand? And just to assuage those fears, it turns out when Matsumiya asked participants using the VR headsets to indicate when a template hand had the same shape as their hand, so when it had the same ratio of length to width as their own hands, they were phenomenally accurate at being able to recognize a template that had the same shape as their own hand, indicating that they did know what shape their hand was. It's just that they didn't necessarily have a good representation of exactly where it was at any given point in time. So what does all this tell us? As we've talked about in previous videos, the brain likes to keep separate sources of information separate. It doesn't like to create situations where streams of information can interfere with each other. And this is also true in the case of representing the body. What we've seen here that's really wild is that even within representing the body, different effector systems, so sight versus reach, can actually have entirely different underlying schema for the position of the body in space. It goes so far as to suggest then that for every different action that you may take, there's going to be a different stream of information that feeds into that action. So in an earlier video, we talked about how there are several different types of coding scheme depending upon what use a motor system is being put to or what task you're trying to accomplish. And here we're talking about how there's actually several different types of body representation depending upon how those representations are going to be used. So we have on the one side different sensory, different ways that sensory information can be represented depending on how it'll be used. And we also have different ways that motor outputs can be coded 
depending upon how those motor outputs are being used. All of it seems to be suggesting that the brain will fundamentally change its coding structure and its information representation depending on the task at hand. But how does it coordinate this? There's just this combinatorial explosion that's going on here with all of these different possible coding schemes. Well, it's a little bit beyond the scope of this video to get into a good answer, but I think at least we're getting to a point of posing the question. And then I think the other thing that Matsumiya's data show us is the degree to which our present moment is just a projection rather than a direct experience. And it's not even a unified projection. It's a projection composed of multiple different body schemas that are kind of splintered, where each effector system, whether it be gaze or reach, has its own representation of the body that's separate from the others. It's a weird thing to think that that's true because somehow it all comes together in a conscious experience that is unified and seems to be one and seems to be completely aligned with the real world in a moment-to-moment -moment fashion. But of course we know it's not. So that's it for this time. Uh, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a comment. And if you're enjoying the content, please consider supporting me on Patreon. The link is down in the description. All right, thanks. Catch you next time.